Hello and welcome to the All Flyers. Today, the 7th of November, is Melbourne Cup Day in Australia, the horse race that stops this nation. This is the race when one horsepower brings victory and wealth to the owners, maybe setting a new record at the same time. For many years, the fastest speed a man could travel was about 70 kilometers per hour on the back of a horse. When trains were invented, they had developed so that by the turn of the 20th century, man could now attain 100 kilometers per hour. Then along came the automobile. At first, no faster than a horse, and certainly not as fast as a train. It was in man's nature to compare one automobile against another. The first auto race was in France between Paris and Rouen in 1894, a distance of 126 kilometers. The winner averaged 17 kilometers per hour, similar to the world's first production petrol motor car, the Benz and C Velo. In 1898 and 1899, electric cars raised speed records from 63 kilometers per hour to 92 kilometers per hour. Steam powered cars raised that record from 1902 to 1906 to reach 205 kilometers per hour. There were incremental improvements to the design of cars and to roads on which they could be driven. This was a competitive environment and claims to have the fastest anything needed to be proved. Someone would need to keep records and that happened to be the Automobile Club of France in about 1902. The majority of cars were being built in Europe at that time. Very few cars were being produced in the United States until Henry Ford introduced the Model T Ford. The Paris to Madrid race of 1903 proved that racing on public roads could be dangerous. Aviation pioneers the Farman brothers and Charles Rolls took part in this race. 122 of the 224 starters didn't reach the first staging post and eight people died during that race. There was no crowd control and spectators stood dangerously close to the roads. Clouds of dust obscured driver's vision. That same year, the first car to be driven over 134 kilometers per hour or 80 miles an hour was American Arthur Duray in a Gobron Brielle with an engine that ran on alcohol. It was also in 1903 that the Wright brothers first sustained and controlled flight took place at Kitty Hawk when the Wright Flyer achieved 11 kilometers per hour in flight. Amazing. Their engine developed just 12 horsepower. Fast forward to 1922 and aero engines had developed exponentially due to the demands of World War I. A Napier aero engine of 18.3 litres developing 350 horsepower was installed in a Sunbeam racing car. Kalem Lee Guinness piloted this car to a land speed record of 208 kilometers per hour at Brooklands. This was the first of the aero engine cars and is captured in this reenactment by his grandson. Many other aero engine cars followed. In 1924, the 21.7 litre Fiat A12 aero engine. In 1926, the V12 Liberty engine. In 1927, the 22.3 litre Napier Lion. In 1933, the 36.7 litre Rolls-Royce R engine. In 1937, two Rolls-Royce R engines in the one car. After that, many more aero engined land speed record holders until we get to July the 17th, 1964, when Donald Campbell drove his Bluebird CN7 powered by a Bristol Proteus gas turbine engine developing 4,000 horsepower to reach 648 kilometers per hour. That record was achieved about 200 kilometers away from where I am now. This was the last of the wheel driven cars. From here on, it would be jet and rocket propulsion using aircraft engines. At first, the speed increases were marginal. For instance, Craig Breedlove drove the turbojet Spirit of America to 655 kilometers per hour, just seven kilometers per hour faster. By 1964, Craig had raised the bar to 847 kilometers per hour. Designers had realized that at these speeds, having smooth aerodynamic shape 
What is important? Drag is in proportion to the square of the speed. Attention must be paid to a smaller frontal area and flow of air separation. Air moves over the vehicle and separates at the rear, creating a wake that is drag. Minimizing drag by design is very important. These are principles that have governed aircraft design from the earliest days. Similarly, attention to weight, just as in aircraft design. As speeds increased, it became apparent that breaking the sound barrier was possible in a car. We know how difficult it was to overcome the sound barrier in an aircraft. Many lives were lost doing so. There was so much to learn. Captain Chuck Yeager is credited with flying faster than the speed of sound in 1947 in a Bell XS-1 rocket. During World War II, some pilots reported that as they dived their piston-powered fighters, control became near impossible and there was severe buffeting as they approached the barrier of sound. What would happen in a car approaching this speed? It was British RAF pilot Andy Green driving thrust SSC powered by two Rolls-Royce Spey engines who found out. It's a popular misconception that driving a land speed record in a straight line is about anchoring the steering wheel, planting your foot to the floor and just waiting till you run out of fuel. If only it were that simple. The car moves around an awful lot. Any road car moves around a little bit and it moves around more so as you go faster. When you go a lot faster, like 700 miles an hour faster, the car moves around a huge amount. The wheels are now skimming across the surface, the shock waves are generating uneven forces, gusts of crosswind, the car is sliding all over the track. In terms of doing a run in thrust SSC, big intakes very close to the ground. I put very little power on to start with to accelerate the car without sucking lumps of desert into the intakes. So initially just inching the throttle forward, letting the car roll slowly, progressively, around about 80% RPM on the engine, that's quite a low power setting, just letting the car accelerate no faster than a normal family saloon car would, uh, pulling away from the lights. Let's see, ready to roll. SSC, with fast chase rolling, you are clear supersonic. Clear supersonic, SSC is rolling. Rolling up through 10, 20, 30, all the way up through 50, 60 miles an hour. The reheat nozzles at the back of the uh, engine start to close down to increase the uh, thrust output. Now accelerating more quickly through 90, 100 miles an hour. Now I've got really strong airflow into the engines. Now I can spin them up very quickly. Ease the throttle forward to the dry stop. The turbines spin up to maximum speed, they are now working flat out. To get more thrust, neat fuel goes into the exhaust and literally reheats the exhaust. Reheat. Check that both needles are showing a light up so that both light together. If one lights and the other doesn't, the car's going to want to go in a circle, which is not good at supersonic speeds. Having got both lit, ease my foot all the way down, both nozzles open fully, we get absolute full power and the car is now accelerating at something like 25 miles an hour every second. 250. 275, 300, 325, and it just keeps going at that speed, up to 500, up to 550, approaching 600 miles an hour. The airflow starts to go supersonic underneath the car, which affects the handling. It goes supersonic over the top of the car. 700, just about in control on the wrong line, don't worry about it. It's the loudest, highest pitch scream I've ever heard. The car tended to pull, because of the way it was constructed and the, the staggered rear wheels, tended to pull hard left at around 600 miles an hour. And that was requiring up to 90 degrees of steering lock to keep it straight. And on our first supersonic record run, it was such a hard pull, I actually had to throttle back to minimum reheat and close the uh, reheat nozzles right down to reduce the thrust, rebalance the car. The car is now 50 feet off line, and I'm steering it effectively on the throttle at 650 miles an hour. As the car starts to respond, as soon as it starts to come back towards the line, I've got to put full power on or we won't get supersonic. And as it comes back to the line, take the opposite lock off, straighten the car back up, now it's going supersonic. At over 700 miles an hour, all the airflow settles down, starts to go fully supersonic, and it runs absolutely as straight as a die. 700, just about in control on the wrong line, don't worry about it. 730, it's a good here, did he? We think we're express, flickering. I think we're under a measured mile. The turn is still good. Excellent. Through the timing lights, 
which took four and a half seconds, about 4.7 seconds uh, to cover the mile through the timing lights. Unbeknown to me, we're also throwing a huge sonic boom out across the desert. My job is still only half done. I now need to stop the car at the other end of the track. So throttling back at the end of the measured mile, we've now got warning captions for all of the oil thrown towards the front of the engines because it's slowing down so quickly. The low fuel caption is flickering. The car is now slowing down at over 1G, over 20 miles an hour per second, but very rapidly as the car gets subsonic, we've got a 10 ton car, very slippery 10 ton car, still hammering along at over 500 miles an hour. I'm waiting until the distance at the end, to the end of the track equals the speed I'm going, which is also changing. And when the two numbers match, punch out the parachute with a button on the left-hand ste steering wheel uh, yoke, and immediately parachute goes out, generates another four or five tons of drag, and bumps the deceleration back up to 20 miles an hour per second. 450, shoot one. Yes, we got it. Everything is going to be wonderful. The car is now going to slow down, and I'm still checking the numbers, slowing down through 400, 350, 300 miles an hour. There's about two miles left to run, 250 miles an hour. 200 miles an hour, we've got a mile left to run. I'm now going to shut the engines down. They've had a few seconds to cool. We don't want to ingest anything else. So shut the engines down, start to ease on the wheel brakes. And I'm now looking about half a mile ahead at looking at the recovery crew so that as we roll to a stop, I ease the brakes on and we stop exactly 14 miles from where we set off, right next to the guys who've got to turn a 10 ton jet car around, put the best part of a ton of fuel in, reload the parachutes, do a full systems and data check and confirm it's safe to go back through the measured mile within one hour. So stopping in the right place is the key bit to starting the pit stop on the fastest car in the world. As you see, the car is stopped, mile 13.5. SC copied. SC or station standby. SC has stopped mile 13.5. SC has stopped. The drive then involves repeating all of that and subsequently stopping the car at the other end and waiting for the timekeeper to have recorded it. 15th of October 1997, he came back with those famous words Pit station, this is USAC timing. I have some times for you. And they were supersonic, and that record still stands today. A sonic boom announced his breaking of the sound barrier at an amazing 1,228 kilometers per hour. The fusion of automotive and aeronautical technology working together. Later, it was revealed that thrust SSC was very near the point of departing the Earth, in other words, taking off. If an A380 aircraft weighing 560 tons can take off at 322 kilometers per hour, then the thrust SSC weighing just 10 tons and traveling nearly four times faster is an accident waiting to happen. Thank you for watching. Comments always welcome. Like and subscribe to encourage new content.